Uh, remember that we're doing this thing where we're reading the title above the inscription that is above the psalm, and we're finding the historical counterpart. And we are comparing the two. Um, to find the spiritual side and uh, the actual historical side. So in Psalm 57, before you even read the psalm, there's an inscription above it. To the chief musician, Altashath, um, um, oh yeah, Mitchum of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. All right, so this is very specific because there's, there's only one place where it mentions him fleeing, fleeing from Saul into a cave, and that's in uh, 1 Samuel 22. So basically what it's saying is that the time that he wrote Psalm 57 was over this incident where, when he had been serving Saul he had been honored by the king. He'd married his daughter and all this kind of stuff. But now he's on the run from Saul, and he flees to Saul into the cave. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, just read the historical part first. So keep your place here in Psalm 57. Um, and turn over with me to 1 Samuel 22. First Samuel 22, 1. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave. So there we have it. Psalm 57 was written right after this escape took place. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave Abdullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab, and, he's, uh, and I want you to notice that he's going to foreign nations. David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. All right? In verse 4, And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the stronghold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the stronghold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. <clears throat> All right, so uh, David here is, uh, you, you sort of have to realize, he has, uh, he, he was a, like a 16-year-old kid. He was tending his father's sheep. He was the youngest out of, I forget how many sons, but a bunch. He really didn't seem to have any aspirations other than to spend time with the Lord and tend his father's sheep, period. That's, I mean, if you really look at his life before that time, that's all he did. However... One day, um, Samuel showed up at his father's house, and he said, you know, I'm going to anoint one of your sons to be king, and of course, the first son came forth, and Samuel himself, the prophet of God, said, surely the Lord's anointed is before us, or, you know, spoke some, something like that. And the Lord said, you know, don't look on the outward appearance because this son was tall and strong and the oldest and all that kind of stuff. 
And um, so then they, they started going through all the sons until they went through all the sons that were there. And finally, Samuel says to Jesse, the father of David, do you not have any more sons? I mean, we've gone through all of these guys and none of them are it. And he went, well, there's the youngest. He's a 16-year-old kid. He's out tending sheep right now. And so David, who was content just to love the Lord, just to get all that spare time, because trust me, <laughs> that's a lot of good time with the Lord. To have all of that time to faithfully be, you know, take care of his father's sheep. You, you know what I mean. I mean, it was literal sheep. And, and he was content to do that just like he would for God under any circumstances. And suddenly he's called out, brought in. God says, this is it. This is the anointed. This is the one that's going to be king. Samuel anoints him as king and then leaves. Well, you know, what's this all about? Uh, so a little time goes on and then David, uh, or uh, Israel, is attacked by the Philistines who send out their champion who says, give me your champion and our champion will fight with your champion and whoever wins will be servants of the other. And everybody is afraid. Everybody except David, who shows up later. His father says, take this food to your brothers. And when he arrives, Goliath is out there berating the people of God, putting them down, saying all sorts of stuff stuff they're all afraid because Goliath is huge and his weapons are huge looking on the outward appearance again and but David has done what nobody else has done David has spent good quality time with the Lord so that when you get in those circumstances it counts it really counts it makes a difference you know, some people say, you people, you just spend all your time in the Word and seeking the Lord. As if that's bad. I, I thought we were Christians. I mean, does that sound weird to anybody that that would, that would be considered a slam against us? Um, I mean, even when I was with Kenneth Copeland, folks, he said, get in the Word. He said, spend time with God. I don't know anybody who's a true man of God on any front, regardless of what they know or don't know, that doesn't tell you you should spend time with God and you ought to get in the Word. <clears throat> well, anyway, apparently David really took God up on that and he did it. So when he got in the crisis, man, his mind is already full of faith. He's already walking with the Lord. You've heard me say many times that you know, God's given us the whole armor of God. He's given us the shield of faith and the time to, to get your faith up. Your faith is a shield. The time to get your faith up is not in the crisis. Because when you start getting hit with fiery darts, your faith drops. It doesn't grow unless your faith is already up. And it hits that shield of faith. And it already, but most people, and this is just my experience, most people that I know aren't prepared for the crisis, for, for the unexpected crisis. We have been trained for many, many years now as, uh, in the church to get prepared for the short-term mission thing. Raise money. Be praying because you're going to go to Honduras for two weeks. <laughs> and so everybody... <laughs> No, oh, you know, and so everybody, I mean, they get into it, and they mean it with all their heart for, for, for a month before, or however long, and they call everybody, they know, I need money, I'm, I'm living for God for two weeks, and of course, everybody's thrilled, oh, we'll give money, yes, you're living for God, 
but it do, they don't hear in their ears for two weeks. Then I'll be back to what I was before. So, so most people are sort of prepared for those kind of deals because they know it's coming. Okay. <clears throat> David just thought he was bringing his brother's food when Goliath walked up and started doing his deal. And they all hid themselves. They were all afraid. And David is 16. Saul is king. All of his, his guy, his leaders were afraid. And David has been with the Lord so much that he looks at that and he goes, you know, and his brothers start telling him, oh, look out, there's Goliath and he's scary and he's big and he's, you know, all this stuff. So David goes and he defeats the enemy. He defeats the enemy. Okay. What is the explanation for that? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could give you three steps? But I can tell you one, and that's not a step per se. Be with the Lord all the time. That's as simple as I can make it. Just be with the Lord and you'll be better prepared than if you're not. All right. So David goes out, 16-year-old kid. Defeats the giant. Well, they're all honoring him and stuff. And then he goes out to battle and they put him up in front. And he, he's defeating Saul's enemies left and right. And Saul's loving it until, until, and, and, and let this be a, a shame on you people who write songs, until people started singing songs. They started singing Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Don't think that by writing songs you can't cause trouble. <laughs> you think, I, won't, I just won't be a preacher. I won't preach Christ. But you can still get in trouble. Then Saul gets jealous. As long as David's working for him, that's fine. But now King Saul is jealous. And so he makes up this plan. He says, if you'll get, you know, the foreskins of I forget how many Philistines, I will let you marry my daughter. So David goes out and gets more than that, more than required. Just, just like, you know, he goes the extra mile. Just like a man of God, a 16, 17-year-old man of God. <laughs> and things just get worse and worse and worse from there. Mike, if you're looking at my stickers, they're little horses and stuff. Abigail gave them to me, so I put them on my pants. <laughs> and those are going, what is that on that guy's pants? <clears throat> um, and uh, so in a certain sense, David had gotten to a place where he came from total obscurity, where Israel was singing songs about him, and, and all the people were responding, and they liked what they saw, and they liked all this stuff. And now, here's what I want you to start. I want you to not just listen to a story, but try to put yourself in that story. Put yourself in the place of a 16-year-old kid in obscurity who's just spending time with God, who is all of a sudden thrust into the limelight and God is blessing everything he does and, and you're thinking if this keeps up I'm going to be king soon and not only that I was anointed king by God through Samuel He's, this guy's been replaced Okay. anybody ever received a prophecy or a word from somebody that you thought man this is going to turn right around and, and it, my whole life's going to be wonderful because of what they just said okay. <laughs> if, if there's anyone who has never had one of those meet me after class and I'll give you one <clears throat> but there, we always have this romantic view of everything we think and this is it we think that what life is all about is that God's just going to open the Red Sea and then the wilderness and then the promised land. Folks, he opened the Red Sea and they got thirsty right after that 
and started having troubles. You, you know what I mean? I mean, we say, well, God will open the Red Sea for you. Yeah, but, you know, then you got 40 years of wandering after that. You know? It's not, a, we, we do not see as he sees. Uh, when I was preaching up in Milwaukee this year, or close to Milwaukee, um, the Lord gave me this little phrase. Ben was with me, and he's preaching also. The Lord told me to walk up there and read that verse. You know, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So I read it and I said, now accept it. That's what the Lord told me to say. Now just accept that. But we think that we are perfectly in tune with the Lord. And I'm, I'm telling you, God is still revamping my thinking. And I've been at this for almost 40 years still working on my understanding and part of it is because of the thing I'm talking to you about now the romantic view of stuff that and you'd think I'd be over that <laughs> you'd think but it's a, religion is a hard thing to shake God will make David king but David has to act like a king between now and then. You understand what I mean? He has to be kingly between now and then. Because you're not going to just magically be that one. <laughs> you, you know, it, it really does take a process. <clears throat> and so, um, so all of a sudden, this thing turns so bad that David runs for his life. And he runs to the cave Abdullah. <clears throat> now, anybody thought romantically of this cave? Because here they go down and uh, there's 400 people gathered to David and they, make, and they make him a captain over him. And I can just see somebody reading that and going, man, this is, this is still going good. Look at this. Folks, these are people that are dis discontented. They are in debt, meaning they don't pay their bills, which means you'll probably end up having to pay them if you're not careful. They are distressed. Okay. Now, uh, that's in contrast, and I probably don't have the scripture marked, but that's in contrast to um, Saul. Yeah, I can't find it off. But King Saul, it says everywhere he went, he gathered all the great men and all the mighty men. Okay. Now, David is sitting there, and okay, he's supposed to be king, but he's in a dark, damp cave. He's supposed to be king over a glorious kingdom, but he's got all the rejects. He's got all the, you know, the people who, who've been having trouble everywhere else. Does that sound like fun? Well, you know, if, if everybody's happy together, I guess it is, you know. I mean, if you can find, find union in Christ in that, then I guess it's okay. But it's not, it's not the kingdom. It's not what you were expecting. And so um, uh, he is concerned about his mother and his father. He has to go to a foreigner who is king over Moab to ask them to help him. I mean, that's getting pretty bad. So now here's what you have to remember. David's life up to this time was pretty good. We know the rest of David's life, and David is just beginning the suffering as an exile that he's, you know, he's going to experience with a whole bunch of outcasts. This is just the beginning. And what you have to remember is that it, it feels uh, more acutely when it's the early stages, when you were innocent, and then it starts happening. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? I'm telling you, it, it, it hurt. The pain is more. The, the knives go deeper in the early stages. Later on, you just go, Pfft, you know, whatever. I mean, I, mean, I, I think I have adjusted 
you know. It's like acupuncture. You know, they think they're stabbing me, and I'm going, yeah, could you put one right here? You know, it might help my aches and pains over here or something like that. You know, but in those early days, and that's why we're going to read Psalm 57, because we're going to hear from David in the early phases of, a, of this thing and how it hurts and the, how the injustice affects him. And, um, and that really and truly he knows it was God who put himself in that situation and not he himself. He didn't just bring this on himself. Did you hear what I said? Now that's, remember we're expecting God to do great things, not put us through some stuff. So that throws you. And uh, David, when he begins to write, and let's go ahead and, and turn over to Psalm 57 now. When he begins to write on this, he begins to deal with different things. Um, David doesn't just have a random trust in the Lord. And I wish I could communicate this. I believe it would change your life if I could. Most Christians are trying to gain some sort of random trust. In other words, I just want to get where I trust the Lord. But David didn't have random trust. He trusted in oneness. He trusted in the shelter of the Lord. He, he trusted in, in God as a mother hen wanting to gather us and to shelter us in him and as one with him. And most people, in their attempt to get more faith, in their attempt to be more trusting of the Lord, fail because they have nothing to hang it on. They're just literally trying to trust. Okay? And I will tell you, if you go by externals, the external view of God will give you reasons not to trust, that you used to trust and now you don't. Right. It's when you understand that you are already sheltered. It's when you understand you were made one and that oneness is going to grow in you until those things are not going to be the issue anymore. <clears throat> then you'll trust and you'll have trust through, see, anybody can trust in good times. Not everybody does, but anybody could. But not everybody can trust in the hard times, especially when those hard times have turned from your expectation, from what you thought it was all about, from how you thought it was going to go. And, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Um, If we don't have a direct line with God regularly, most of us don't, not the way we should, then I would suggest you find one person, you find somebody that you trust in the Lord, somebody that you believe really has a relationship with the Lord, and let them have the freedom to tell you when your thoughts are wrong, even though you think they're everything. I'm not telling you to let them guide your life. I'm telling you, have somebody that you can bounce stuff off of and that can at least tell you you're heading down a bad road if you think that's the way it's going to go because there's, somebody has to be able to see more than you. Don't you agree? Surely there's somebody that can see more than you do. And you need to be able to have somebody that you really believe hears from God and and. You know, just so you'll know, if you think I'm talking about myself, I would prefer it not be me. <laughs> but there, the value to you when you are set, because when you're set and then it ends up crashing down and God leads off in a direction like going to a cave when you didn't think that's, you thought you were going to a throne room, and you can't reconcile it, it's nice to talk to somebody that might have a little insight. Okay, enough said. Does that, does that make sense, everybody? <laughs> All right. All right, verse, verse 1. 
Well, the last words of the little title was, when he fled from Saul in a cave, be merciful unto me. <laughs> right? You see the flow, you see it running together, oh God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be passed by. Notice where his trust is. He's not just trusting in God in general. He's trusting in the shadow of his wings. He's trusting in him. He's trusting in the, in the oneness that is there that keeps him. And he doesn't say, I trust you to make these calamities go away. He says, I'm trusting to rest in the shadow of your wing till they're gone. Not you make them go away. But my trust will be in you, not in what you do. Okay? Verse 2, I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performeth all things for me. And I wrote his cries not just to get, generic, uh, get any generic aspect of God, but to the most high. Some of you have been around long enough to know that that, that actually pertains to the Lamb. He is the most high. Who is seated on the throne of all the universe when it's over with? The lion. No. <laughs> the lamb. <clears throat> okay? He is the initiator and performer and not David. He is David's life and as such, he performs it for David. You can say through him. But it is the Lord who's bringing it about. Verse 3, he, um, because, before I go to verse 3, is God who performeth all things for me by his life within. Now this is new, I'm giving you New Testament reality. By his life within. Verse 3, he shall sin from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. And so he's talking about this reality of being in Christ in heavenly places and the manifestation of that. Folks, you've got to abide there a while before anything manifests. It's like planting a seed in the, a seed in the ground. Okay. Consider, did, what did Jesus liken faith to? A grain of mustard seed, right? A seed, right? Well, if you, he said, your faith, if your faith be as a grain of mustard seed, well, you put it in the ground, and you don't go, okay, well, I put it in the ground, I'm believing, why isn't there fruit? You have to abide in that for a while. You have to trust in that. You have to believe for it until one day it begins to bring forth its fruit. You say, but I'm in trouble now. That's our problem. That's what I keep trying to say is that we don't want to initiate faith until we get in the trial. We need to have a big old tree growing, a tree of faith long before the junk happens. Okay? So the manifestation of something takes, you know, a long time. Even, even a child. I mean, it's in there for nine months. Patty's got a baby in her right now. Well, I don't see it. I don't believe that. I don't see it. I don't feel it. Well, she does. You know, she's got another life in her. But folks, even if her tummy gets bigger, that's still not the big manifestation she's waiting on. Okay? <laughs> the big manifestation is when it's out. Where everybody can see it. And go, there it is. Okay? Okay? Just because you got it in you, just because you're believing right now, that's not the manifestation of it. And, and you're going to have to wait, and you might have to wait through several storms before the manifestation of it comes. I wrote in my night notes, God sends from his reality above. David is being reproached and swallowed up with false accusations by those who say he rebelled against Saul. And that he seeks to set himself up. And this was the accusation against David. They said, he is rebelling against Saul. Now that's ridiculous, but that's nonetheless, that's what they said. 
He's rebelling against Saul, and he's trying to set himself up as king. I'm sure when David heard that, he thought, I, I wasn't trying to say, I was a shepherd boy for God's sake. Samuel showed up and started this mess. I didn't do it. I bet you in these early stages, he said stuff like that. I think later on you adjust, but in the early stages, you're going, this, you're, you're appalled. You're just going, where is this coming from? This is just insane to consider this. David, when he was serving under Saul with Saul, was the most faithful man that Saul had <laughs> to him in this kingdom. But that's, all of this is stuff that we have to learn to deal with. Why? Because if God said something to you about what he's going to do with you, whatever that is, if God, if you, if you have an inkling within you of what, of the potential of what God can do with you, he cannot put you in that situation until certain things have been settled in you. He's not being mean, he's being wise. Because if he put you in that situation in your present state, you wouldn't be in it very long. <laughs> and because you wouldn't handle things right, your judgments wouldn't be right. Your judgments would be just like the people's judgments, except for from your perspective, you know. But they would be earthly, they would be based on sight, they would be based on circumstances, they would be based on how well things appear, how bad they appear. But David is learning right now from the very beginning. He's learning, let me tell you, you can't go by what you see. I got 400 men, Saul's got, you know, 4 million. <laughs> they believe this, and it's not true, and only 400 don't. And he's beginning to wonder, does anybody see? You know what I mean? Does anybody grasp? Is anybody really hearing from God? And I, I've, I've said this a lot recently, but two words, learn, three words, learn to discern. Learn to discern. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about your basic gifts of discernment or whatever. One of the big failures of all the kings that failed was they couldn't, they couldn't tell what was just and unjust, what was, what was God and what was not God. Something could pawn itself off as being of God, and they would, you know, the kings would fall for it. And um, I can see how easy it would be to not know anything about discernment because when I went to Bible school I didn't know beans about anything all I knew was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's all I knew and I thought that's how you judge stuff I mean I really did I thought well it's, that's evil so it's bad but this is good and God said those are on the same tree don't eat of that tree I don't care how they seem to contrast the roots are the same well, they would tell me something, and I remember this clearly. They would, you know, they would tell me something. I go, well, that ain't right. I would see somebody make a decision. I go, well, that ain't right. I mean, I did this. You say, well, you reap what you sow, buddy. <laughs> well, I sure have. And I repent. <laughs> But I did. I remember. I was there. I, I had no clue, you know, the angle they were coming from. They would discern this about that person based on the Lord, and I wouldn't see it. They would say, well, you know, maybe that person you better watch out for. Well, they seem really good to me. <laughs> you, know, do, 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 do. you know, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a sheep. I'm, I'm not even a sheep. I'm just a dumb little lamb. I'm just a, I'll, I'm, the best thing I can do is chase butterflies. You know, oh, it looks pretty, do, 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 and I'll chase it off in the woods where the wolves are. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. I was innocent. 
Don't chase the butterflies. Well, y'all are mean. You make these hard decisions. Well, you, you, can, you, know, you can teach this. I'm teaching. I'm talking about. But you can't teach someone how to discern the Lord when it is the Lord. And when something appears literally as an angel of light. If you don't have that down in you, you're going down. Know? And, it, and it doesn't come with joy and happiness and every sea opening before you. <laughs> it comes through, you, you're not even aware of how many people go by sight until you're in a cave with 400 people. And then you go, dang, you know. They just, somebody just say something and they all go, well, that's the way it is. Okay? And something registers in you, we need, you know, I need to pay more attention in this area. Because why? First of all, I'm sure David said that because his heart was after God. Second of all, when God finally puts you in that position, you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it. That's all I can say about it. All right. Um, verse uh, 4. My soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Okay. Um, I wrote, they are beasts, lion. They are beasts and David is a lamb. It shows how sharp and how deep the wounds of one who only seeks to serve God and others it, and is not these things. Right now, everything is so acute to David because this is all new to him. But you have to remember, this will do more to make you the man of God that God wants than anything else. I know that's hard to believe. I'm sorry to tell you. It's the truth. You've got to go through a bunch of stuff, and it's God's training ground. We, you know, most in the church teach nothing but happy trails and, you know, rose petals and whatever, and that's the path of the Lord. Okay. But I'm telling you, it's not the case. <clears throat> and then there's this other part of David saying, here's what they're like. They're offensive. Their teeth are like swords and all of this because their mouth is constantly saying stuff that would uh, do this. All right, verse 5. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Most Christians honor God um, up to the heavens. <laughs> You said be exalted above the heavens. Most Christians exalt God to the heavens. Not above. They don't know anything about an exaltation above the heavens. So they exalt God, you know, to the heavens. Uh, I wrote, we honor God up to heaven and based on earth, but there is an exaltation of him not based on what he does in earth, not based on what he does in the earth, or the gift of gaining heaven. His victory will manifest God's glory of what he had planned. Did you have your hand up? Yes. Be drunk 
into this instead of lifted up into him? Well, the old, old time saints used to take it like this. This earth is bad, it's hard. Uh, you, you could even talk about the uh, slaves. You know, uh, I want to go to heaven and rest. I'm tired of staying down here. I'm tired of my troubles and trials. I want to go to heaven and rest. Okay. So they could take this scripture and say, that's what I'm doing. I just hate this. Or I hate what's going on. I hate this and that. I want to go to heaven. Okay. But David said to be exalted, be thou exalted above the heavens. Okay. Because he's realizing that simple escape, escapism, is not the answer either. You know, it's, people say, I wish Jesus had come back today. I, when, when we were Jesus freaks, I remember, you know, you'd have a rough day. You know, you have a bad day. Can you believe it? We're, we're Jesus freaks. We love Jesus, but we're having a bad day. I just wish Jesus had come back today. I remember saying that. I just wish he'd come back today. What about yesterday? No, yesterday was glorious. Does, yeah, do does, you see any conflict in that concept there? No. Someone who really wants the Lord begins to evaluate not their situation, but their motives. But even in that, even in the darkness, you know, the darkness of the standing in there, mm -hmm. it seems to me, and I could be totally wrong, I'm just kind of throwing this out there, but... Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? And so it's like, it's almost like the Lord's still coming out even though you don't understand it. I'm saying you want the Lord, you, yes, your, your, your soul wants him to come and save you from the situation, but there's, if you just step back and look at it, there's obviously a need for Jesus to show up in that situation. Sure. And so that's, anyway. Okay, uh, verse uh, 6 then. <clears throat> Uh, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Now, one of the things that you have to remember is that there are just a handful of psalms. Now, listen carefully to this. There are only a handful of psalms that identify themselves with a historical place over in 1 Samuel or 1 Kings or Chronicles or something like that. There's just a small amount. There's not a large, I mean, there's a 150 psalms. But there's only a few of them that are saying, I wrote this psalm when I was in this situation. So I find that extremely valuable. And, and answer me this, don't you think that God in his wisdom would have handpicked the particular situations and then matched the writings of one who is going through it for our edification? Not just something he's going through, but maybe in those five, six, or however many Psalms there are that are like that, that you and me are going to find ourselves, we may not have a physical cave but we may be locked in and blocked in. We may be, you know, sooner or later, there's a chance that you're going to be in some of these situations. And God was gracious enough to you and me to match them up so that we could not just see what someone went through and hope that we come out with the right spirit but that we could literally see what a man's going through and see where his emphasis lies. And that God would call that, that's the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? God would say, when he wrote that, now that's my word. That's the word of God to you. Okay. So these are not small things. When, when David's saying these things, I hope we're not just going, oh, well, that's good or whatever. I hope we're realizing if I'm not in that same place where David's at, I'm probably going to be like uh, Joab. 
other people who were in the same situation, but they didn't write the word of God. They didn't put it down. God, if they wrote it down, God didn't accept it. God did accept this and said, this is acceptable and will be counted as the word of God for all generations. All right. So I'm just saying that to, to, to warn you that these are not light things. I mean, you know, this is not just a Bible school class we're having here. This is God speaking to us by his word. All right, in verse 6, we see that, you know, through what he's saying, they're active in their work to destroy David. And his soul is feeling the grief, amen? His soul feels the grief. But just like we quoted in uh, other places, here is another example of that where uh, they've digged a pit for me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. And that, folks, to me, is just a comfort to understand that even God himself, and I know I'm repeating from other classes, but even God himself doesn't have to do anything. The very thing that they're working hard to destroy you with is going to be what destroys them. Can you, can you believe that? Or, or do you have to strike back? You know, and I say strike back. I mean, Peter said, who being reviled, reviled not. So we're even talking about, you know, they revile you and you go, I'm reviling you. But, you know, here's, the, here's how you can revile back. Well, you're digging a pit and you're going to fall into it yourself. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean when I say that? That you're just reviling back, you know. Um, I want to do a search on Jude because Jude, I haven't, I haven't searched this out yet, but Jude gets into this thing where he is, he says, whose ungodly ways, ungodly, da-da-da-da, but then he's the one who brings up the fact that even Michael, the archangel, didn't, or was it Michael? Yeah, didn't revile back, but said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I thought, that seems funny because that guy seems like a reviver. I've ever heard one. So I want to check that out. I mean, he does. He does. You know, so I want to check that one out a little closer. But then, but then he said, I mean, he, he, he marks the ground, though, and he says, no, this is, but this is the principle. So, you know. All right. Um, uh, verse 7. My heart is fixed, oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Now, this is the first time that he's really like breaking out of the cave spiritually. You understand what I'm saying? He's still in the cave. He may be in the cave a while, but he's breaking out of it spiritually. My heart is fixed, oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Um, Okay, there's something broken about us. There's something, you know, we may be broken because of what someone has done to us or whatever, but whatever reason, there's still something broken about us. Um, but David says, my heart is fixed. See, we want, him, we want God to fix the situation. God wants to fix us. I think God's ready to punish all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. I think he's ready to, I think he stands ready to do that. I don't think there's any problem with all that. Um, we have a broken heart, or, or, or let's see, what did I say here? We have a broken heart and want God to fix it, but our heart can be broken and fixed in him. In other words, we can be broken over the situation. We can be hurt over the situation, get this, and still be fixed in him. You can be going through terrible things and still be fixed in him. Maybe you're not fixed fully in you, but you are fixed in him. Praise, not because all is fixed, but because you are fixed and focused on him. Because you know what it means to fix your eyes on something? It means to focus. It means to put your attention there. 
My heart is fixed on the Lord. My heart is fixed in the Lord. That's where my focus is. And then you can praise. Not because all is fixed, but because you are fixed on him and in him. Yes. Amen. Very well said. Nisi was just saying that that's the difference between anointing and oneness, that David was anointed, but he wasn't one in these early going. He was learning oneness. Oneness is not easy to learn. You would think it'd be so easy, but it's not easy to learn. Why? Because everything in the sense realm is pulling at you, telling you the opposite. And so what she was saying is that God was using these things to fix him into that oneness. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 8. Uh, awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. That's morning praise. The morning, the, the whole burn offering is offered in the morning and in the evening. And, uh, and it's offered when the light comes and when the light's going down. Did you know that? I mean, that's the, you'd think that just a whole burnt offering would be one, but there's actually two, one in the morning and one in the evening. <clears throat> and so he's, he's admitting, it's like my soul was asleep, here's, here's the translation. My soul was bowed down, bowed down like I'm asleep. He's equating the two. He's using that, that sort of terminology there. Uh, but an awakening is happening. An awakening happens. And an awakening doesn't make the day. It doesn't form the day. It doesn't make the day happen. You know. As a child, you might think, every time I wake up, God makes the sun come up. You know, uh, in the old days, they used to have to go to school way earlier when it was still dark. I would assume that up north it might still be that way. <laughs> you know, that it's a lot darker. Um, and so if you're a kid and you get up and it's dark and then you're getting dressed and everything and you're on your way to school and the sun starts coming up, you might think, my awakening brings the light. But I'm sorry, if you never awoke, if you laid there for two days and never woke up, the sun would still come up. It's not, you're not bringing it about. It's when the day dawns and we see it, then we are praising him for the right thing. The, the light is shining into my soul and I'm waking up. And, and here's the deal. We want some people to wake up, man. You know, those, those destroyers, those lions with teeth. We want them to wake up. God's wanting you to wake up. See? And, and if we just figure, God, can God is almighty, all-powerful. He can deal with anybody he wants to. He can deal with people. But he's having the hardest time dealing with his own people. <laughs> That's you and me. That's where he's getting the most problems. Verse 9, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing unto thee among the gods. And I wrote, the peoples is not a glorious congregation in the temple, but a group of misfits in the cave. <laughs> See, when we read that, we read, we're thinking, I will praise thee in the midst of the congregation. I will, you know, we still keep this romantic view. David's writing this in a cave with a bunch of misfits. And those are the peoples he's going to start praising God and showing forth. Yes.
Right. Right. And he did that over and over and was an example to the people. <clears throat> I like the end of that verse, verse 9, where it says, I will sing unto thee among the nations, because uh, that's all the places he was driven as an outcast, to Moab, to the Philistines. Remember, he ended up going to the nations. <laughs> well, that's what happened in Jerusalem, folks. After Jesus rose from the dead, God sent persecution. Well, let's put it this way. Jesus rose from the dead, appeared to his disciples. We always have a picture like this, you know. If you've ever been to uh, the University of Notre Dame, outside of the football stadium, if you walk straight out the end, there's a building, and it's got a big picture of Jesus like this, and they call it Touchdown Jesus. <laughs> and uh, here's Jesus standing there with his people. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, folks, they didn't do it. They stayed right there in Jerusalem until God sent persecution. Persecution is the power. <laughs> oh, God, give us power to take this message. Okay. You, you know, they start getting all this persecution and stuff and spreading out, you know. You see, God uses things we may not always like about it. <clears throat> All right, let me, we're getting close to the end here. I'm getting signs there. Um, verse 10. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. And I wrote, his mercy is great, awesome is the word. Uh, thy mercy is awesome, how God intri intricately works things not based on our minds. He's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome because it's outside of the box, which our mind is the box. This is how he reaches the world. His truth reaches under the storm clouds that scare us, but bring us the rainbow and the sun. And then finally, verse 11. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. <clears throat> David wants God's glory to be above our hope for heaven and based on more than what he does for us in the earth. Saul had the temple and he had the kingdom and the people's hearts, but Ga David had God in a way that was above all of that. The cave was where the outcast heard eternit eternal reality from David's mouth around the campfire. What moments must those have been like? Because David was knowing the Lord. He did, he was a man with a heart after God. And when he got in those circumstances, just like what Jennifer was saying, when he got in those circumstances, he would get with the Lord. And, and like, like she said, they may be grumbling, they may be going through stuff, but he would get with the Lord and he would lift up his eyes from the circumstances and get his eyes on Jesus. And they would be in that cave and they'd gather around the fires at night, rejects, they got nobody else in the world but they got one another, and they got David as their captain. And David is a man that they, they're hearing the eternal word of God. They're, they're hearing a heart like none of them have had or anybody that they were around. And they're hearing all that, and it's flowing over them. And those guys stayed with David his whole life. <laughs> you know, and David probably didn't even know what all he was putting in them. He's just going after the Lord. He's just loving the Lord. All right. Let's take a break and we'll come back. <clears throat>